All right. Uh, and uh, the meeting is being recorded. I just heard from an automated voice. Okay, so I'm, I'm gonna go ahead um, and start. Thanks so much for this, for the great day. I you know, met, met with a number of you. I had stimulating, interesting discussions. It was, was really, really great. Um, and I hope that, you know, with all of you at some point, we'll be able to meet in uh, a person uh, again at some point in the future. But for now, from my home to yours, some of the work um, that we've been up to um, in the lab recently. And um, everything I'll be talking about is about genetic variation in populations. And um, by way of making sure we're all of the same page, I'm going to start with one of the more, uh, one of the most heavily studied traits in terms of complex trait genetics, that's the trait of human height. And I'm going to do this by showing this iconic image, which shows uh, several college students that are lined up according to how tall they are. And when we do this, we then see that there's some individuals that are really tall, some that are fairly short, and most people are somewhat in the middle, such that when you group them like this, you um, see this nice, beautiful uh, living histogram illustrating the quantitative distribution of human height. Now, height uh, is a trait that can, of course, be influenced by the environment. If uh, somebody doesn't get enough nutrition early on in life, they're not going to grow as tall as otherwise they might have. But it turns out that most of the variation that exists in a given population, like, you know, you, if we were in a room together now, um, is due to genetics. So the alleles that you have inherited from your mom and from your dad. And uh, what we as uh, geneticists would like to do is understand um, this variation. So here's how we think about it. Let's say we've taken our students, we've uh, sequenced their genome and we line them up. Then we see that, you know, and here's just a little snippet of the genome. Um, we, we see that people tend to be the same across most of the genome, but if you squint, you see that there is variation scattered across here. And what we're then after are sites such as this one, where tall people tend to carry one allele, shorter people tend to carry another allele. And then we think it's something about this uh, difference or something in this region um, that contributes to human height, right? And our, our jobs as complex trait genetics is to then to um, understand the genetic architecture of traits, which means find as many of these variants as possible and understand um, what they do. Um, and because uh, you are mostly in an evolution department, I, I'm just gonna quickly, quickly put my plug here there isn't really much evolution in, in the talk today, but uh, in, in my view, you know, nothing in evolutionary biology makes sense except in the light of complex gray genetics, because it's really, you know, that variation um, of, of variants in a given population that influences traits is really the material upon which selection or, you know, that neutral processes can then operate um, in terms of uh, ultimately leading to evolutionary change between species as well. So we're sort of, you know, this is sort of an evolutionary process, the leaf frequency is changing over time. We're sort of taking a slice through that process that is now, and we're trying to understand what is um, the architecture of traits now. Okay, so we've done this, of course, a fair bit for, for a large number of traits. Here is a relatively current result for the genetic architecture of human height. Uh, what you're looking at is the human genome. Here are the different chromosomes on the x-axis. On the y-axis, we have statistical significance. The higher, the better. Um, every dot is a genetic variant, a sequence difference. And anything that's above the black, this black line here is a significant association. So we're sure it's, it's there, it's real. And the only thing I really want you to take away from this is that there's a lot of stuff above the line, right? There's not just a single locus or two loci that matter for how tall people become. Um, every chromosome, and indeed we now know almost every one megabase size region of the, of the human genome contains some variation that influences um, how tall we are, um, each then with um, relatively small effects. So human height isn't the only trait that behaves like this. Um, many traits that, that other traits that we might care about, morphological traits, but also common diseases um, have these complex genetic architectures. So here's just a screenshot um, from the um, National Human Genome Research Institute. You see the different chromosomes here. And just in cartoon form, associations for things like diabetes, the risk for heart attack, um, many other common diseases um, are you know, very highly distributed across the genome. 
So the question then becomes, of course, okay, we've, we've, we've gotten good at mapping these things. What does all this genetic variation actually do, right? How do you go from a change somewhere in the genome to a change in a trait that you care about? And um, some of the answer is, is shown here in this um, figure from a paper from, from 2014 that I'd like to use for this. What was done here is um, the researchers took the human genome, broke it into functional categories, and then asked um, how much does variation in this functional category contribute to the genetic contribution to a number of traits. So this here, this little box, is all the protein coding exons in the human genome combined. And you see that variation in the exons, their joint contribution is something like 10% or so to total genetics, which is more than we expect by chance, which is sort of this one little 1% 1 here. So it's enrichment, but of course still only 10%. Most of uh, the genetic contribution comes from variation in gene regulatory elements that are pretty well annotated in the human genome um, by now, suggesting that it's really changes in gene expression that um, have these large contributions um, to uh, change in genetically complex traits. So that's um, what we'll be spending the rest of the seminar talking about, genetic influences on gene expression. And just to really make 100% sure we're all on the same page, um, here's uh, another slide on this. Here's a population of individuals. And then the idea is that some of us have allelic variation, like this uh, blue allele here, that in one mechanistic way or the other uh, results in some of us having more mRNA for a given gene of interest. Um, we would then think that this extra mRNA results in additional protein for that given gene. And then it's something about the differential abundance of that protein, at, at least for, for most genes, it's then the protein, the different differential abundance of that that matters for a trait that we care about. Right? So this is the, the general scheme that we'll be operating in for all of um, the talk today. Because while, of course, we understand the broad strokes of this, there's still um, a number of, of important open questions that we'll be um, tackling. Um, and some of them we'll be tackling today. Um, here they are. We'll be talking about where in the genome is um, regulatory genetic variation. So where are these variants that change gene expression variation? Um, what are the individual causal variants, the actual um, you know, nucleotide level changes that are responsible? And then what about this um, um, assumption I made that most effects on mRNA are also going to have an effect? on protein levels. So there's other questions, but these are the ones that we'll be tackling um, today. Um, we will tackle them before I discuss that. I should say that in the background of all this is, is a bigger, even bigger picture, even bigger picture question, um, which is, can we ultimately get to a point where we can perhaps predict traits, or let's, let's be modest initially and say, can we predict gene expression from individual genomes um, where we know the variants in a given genome, can we use that to say which genes are going to be expressed at which level? So this is um, something that will recur throughout the talk as a theme sitting on top of the projects I'll be telling you about. Um, the work we're doing um, is happening in the yeast Saccharomyces cerevisiae. Um, as you know, it's a wonderful model organism, a single-celled fungus, shares much of its basic cell biology with us. But it has a number of experimental advantages that make it a great model system for complex ray genetics. These include, you know, a, a, a simple, um, neatly organized, well annotated genome, a rich set of tools that we have at our disposal to modify the genome very easily to um, use all kinds of reporter systems, and you'll see some examples of that, but also the ability to grow very large sample sizes. And we'll see throughout why that is an important thing in complex trait genetics. Now, none of this would really help us much if there weren't genetic variation among different yeast strains, but fortunately there is. So we'll be focusing today on just two isolates of yeast, one shown here, uh, a common laboratory strain that I'll sometimes uh, call BY. Um, and we're gonna compare it to this strain here, a strain that was isolated from a vineyard in California called RM. Um, and then these two strains are genetically different individuals. So their genomes differ um, at about one variant on average every 200 basis or so. 
um, which is actually five times more different than two typical human genomes would be from each other. So there's a lot of variation between these two strains that we can use uh, for our purposes, understanding complex strain genetics. Um, so let's get to our first question, where in the genome, you know, where, is, where are these um, sites that influence gene expression? And um, I'm going to frame this around a study that we published a number of years ago that we started in the final year of my postdoc with Lina Kugliak, um, where Josh Bloom and I um, started gathering the data that we then published um, in eLife uh, in, in 2018. So what we did was to take our two strains, the lab strain and the wine strain, which are usually haploid, we crossed them into a diploid um, yeast, and then Josh had earlier um, sporulated the hybrid to generate um, meiotic offspring. So if you, see, if you sort of look carefully, you see that each of these offspring here is a recombinant version of the two parental alleles. And uh, Josh had generated um, more than a thousand of these recombinant um, individuals, and he had already whole genome sequenced them. And what we then did for our study was to take these individuals and, did, and do whole transcriptome sequencing to measure the expression of every gene in the genome in these 1,000 individuals. Um, what we then did with these is something called expression quantitative trait locus mapping or EQTL mapping. Um, that's a bit of a mouthful. Um, so let me take a moment to explain what, what an EQTL is. What we're doing is we're, we're marching through the genome and at uh, every position, we're grouping these uh, segregants based on whether they have inherited the lab allele or the wine strain allele. And then we ask for a given gene of interest, whether there's a difference in expression level for these individuals that have inherited the one or the other allele. Um, in this case here, in this region then, you can see there is not a difference. Um, but over here, uh, if we group them this way, you see that the wine allele has a higher expression level. And then we plot this here along the genome again. Um, this is another measure of statistical significance. Um, we plot it as this region uh, that tells us something here is influencing gene expression. Um, it is a fairly wide region, and that's an important thing to keep in mind that EQTLs are regions, not yet individual uh, mutations. And then we repeat this process for every gene that we've measured um, in our data set. Now, why did we do this in a thousand individuals? We knew that a thousand individuals would give us high statistical power to detect um, these um, EQTLs, which tend to have fairly small effects, right? So this is what, what nature has produced for us. And it's just shown here, um, the fraction of variance that a locus explains. Earlier studies had used about 100 individuals. You can see the statistical power to detect these low size is shown in blue. And for our new study in red, the statistical power is really quite a bit higher. Um, with this uh, high statistical power, um, we were then able to get to a fairly comprehensive view of um, where in the genome these EQTLs are. And this is shown here on the x-axis. We were um, estimating for every gene, so every dot here is a gene. Um, we were estimating um, the, the heritability of gene expression or mRNA levels. Um, this, I don't have time to really go into the details of how we do this, but I'll just say this gives us a maximum value that we can possibly hope to account for in the strain, right? So if we were able to account for all the genetics um, in the strain, it would, in these two strains, it would be this value here. And then on the y-axis is the amount of genetic variation that we've actually accounted for with the regions that we've then been able to map. And you see that this really nice um, agreement on an average, we're capturing about 70% or so of the total genetic signal, which means that the map you're about to see is in some sense a fairly comprehensive map, a fairly comprehensive accounting of genetic, regulatory genetic variation in the genome. Okay, so finally, here is the map. So this is, you know, where is all the, where are the EQTLs in the genome? This is where they are. It's a complex figure, so we'll be taking our time um, stepping through it for actually the next um, 25 minutes or so of this talk. But don't worry that we won't just look at the same slide for 25 minutes. We'll be, you know, circling back to this uh, uh, and talk about other things in between. So what are we looking at? Um, we're looking at here um, the genome, and this is, this is the position, the physical position of genes in the genome. Um, and these are different chromosome numbers. 
And on the y-axis, we have also the genome. And here we're plotting um, the position of the locus that influences the expression of a given gene. And we'll start by focusing on this diagonal here. These are variants that are close to the gene that they altering, perhaps in the promoter. And then the promoter is where the gene is. So the x-axis, so, so x equals y, you know, locus is the same as gene position, and we get this beautiful diagonal here. Um, we then found in this study that more than half of the genes in the genome have one of these local EQTLs where um, there is, for the most part, cis-acting variation influencing the expression of, of, um, of these genes. And this, although we're only looking at a single pair of strengths, right? So there's a, a lot of genetic variation, um, enough to change the expression of half the genes in the gene. So let's talk about this local variation for a little bit for the, for the next you know, 15 minutes or so. Um, because we're going to use these local EQTLs as a model for understanding the nature of causal variants um, that create regulatory variation. Specifically, we're going to ask it, what are the causal variants at these local EQTLs? So here's another view of the yeast uh, genome. You know, we, each arrow is a gene. Um, this is essentially to scale. You know, the yeast genome is neat. Uh, most genes are single exon, they're separated by a kilobase or so of intergenic space that contains promoters, 6,000 genes in total. And I just told you that about half of these genes are uh, influenced by one of these local cis-acting um, EQTLs. And before that, I told you that the two strains we look at um, have one variant, every, every one nucleotide variant, every 200 bases or so. And what that means is that uh, most genes have somewhere in their vicinity a number of variants, right? So not just one, but you know, it's a distribution, but usually multiple variants are close to each gene. And that then creates the question, which of these variants are actually the ones that are creating um, all these local expression changes? And this is the question we then went after with a project that um, also started a fair number of years back when I was just about to leave LA, when we started teaming up with the lab of uh, Sri Kosuri, in particular a postdoc in his lab, uh, Rocky Chong. And what Sri and Rocky are um, uh, really experts in is this technique of a massively parallel reporter assay. And then we, uh, we designed one of those to map uh, the effects of um, individual regulatory variants. This is how we did it. Um, for a given variant in the genome, let's say we look at this one, um, we synthesized two synthetic DNA oligos that are 140 bases long, um, centered on the variant, um, and then we made two of these oligos that had the same sequence except for just that sequence difference at this one allele, right? So two oligos um, uh, measuring one variant, um, they get cloned in front of a reporter gene. This is yellow fluorescent protein um, in our case. And then the idea is that the expression of this protein or of this reporter um, gives you a measure of the relative allelic activity of, of these two variants. So this is what we would do for one variant. We didn't want to do it just for one variant. We wanted to do it in a genome-wide fashion or nearly genome-wide fashion. So we designed a library of these oligos of over 70,000 of them that, as you can see here, then tile across the genome such that for every variant that we're testing, there's a pair of oligos that is uh, spanning them that differ at just uh, the sequence of, of that variant. The, over, the, the, the design is, is a bit more complex than that in reality, but this sort of illustrates the, the idea at least. So, okay, we designed a couple of thousand of these oligos that then um, targeted about 7,000 of these natural promoter variants in these 2D strains in, in 3,000 genes or so, right? So this uh, library of DNA oligos, you can then go and purchase um, from Agilent um, or from Twist Biosciences and, and other vendors like that. And then they show up in one tube. Um, we then clone them um, in bulk. So, you know, you get your tube, you do PCR, you stick them in front of your reporter. We added these random sequence barcodes um, that we put behind the reporter gene and that we annotated by sequencing the ideas that then the abundance 
of these barcodes gives us a readout of the activity of the given promoter fragment, right? And we had multiple barcodes for each of these oligomers. Um, all right, so that's what we did. We bulk cloned and annotated the library. And then that library went onto a plasmid, um, a single copy plasmid, low copy number plasmid. Uh, the plasmid went into yeast. And then, you know, we grow that yeast culture in bulk and then we extract um, RNA and we extract DNA. We need the DNA to normalize for a different uh, representation of these um, different oligos in the library. Um, yeah, and then we, you know, pull out uh, DNA and RNA. We then do PCR and just pull out these little barcodes. Um, and then the barcodes get sequenced um, on an Illumina instrument and counted. The data then ends up looking like this. So here's one, here's an example of one variant of one pair of oligos. So we have the counts for RNA, the counts for DNA, we form a log ratio, and then here's this ratio for the lab allele and for the wine allele. And you know, it looks like okay, this higher here in the lab allele. There's only so much you can say based on a single replicate. So we made sure to you know replicate all of our experiments a number of times. And for this variant, then um, with this replicate data and, and proper statistical analysis, we can then say, like, okay, indeed, there is a, a significant, statistically significant difference between um, these two alleles. So this variant here is likely caused. So another reason I'm showing you this variant is not just because it looks pretty, um, but because we already knew from independent work that it's, it's a real variant. Um, this variant resides here in the promoter of this only one gene um, in this known regulatory element. And um, Sheila Lutz, a wonderful research scientist in the lab, had totally independently in an, in an entirely different project identified this variant as being responsible for a local EQTL of this only one gene. Here is the data, uh, her published data from her paper. And if you compare it to what we found in the MPRA library, you see this really nice concordance, right? So clearly then the library is able to capture the effects of, of um, real variants that influence gene expression in the genome. Now, fortunately, we found not just that one variant, but, but a couple of hundred, here they all are. Um, you see the fold change that these variants are causing in gene expression, significance. Um, we found 451 or so of these variants at a good false discovery rate. And I want to quickly draw your attention to the fact that most of the fold changes that these variants are causing are um, not enormous. So uh, this here would be twofold. This is uh, you know, twofold down, twofold up. So most variants have smaller effects than that, which well matches what we expected for natural variation in this, in this cross, right? So, okay. What we, then, what we were then, of course, curious about is whether these variants that we identified you know, in the synthetic assay on a plasmid, whether they were able to account for what we started with, what was this diagonal of local EQTLs, right? Whether those effects in the genome can to some extent be explained by the single variants in the promoters that we identified in our assay. This is what, just what we're going to do. We're going to compare the effect of these single variants with the effects that we measured in our earlier study. Um, and indeed, what we found is um, a positive, significant correlation. I mean, it's, it's certainly, you know, there is noise in the system still. The, the estimates aren't perfect. But there is a significant positive um, correlation suggesting that, indeed, our um, plasmid-based assay is indeed able to um, recapitulate and explain some of these effects that were previously seen in the genome. Here is the only one um, variant and gene that I just showed you. And in, in this case, the variant effect on the, um, in the MPRA explains really well, actually, the effect that we had mapped in, in, in the genome before. Now, some promoters um, in our assay had not just one causal variant, but multiple causal variants. And in those cases, when we take the effects of those independent, independently significant variants and add them up, the correlation with these local EQTLs um, improved a little bit. So before it was 0.4, now it's 0.5. Uh, 
suggesting that indeed um, a number of promoters in this um, in this yeast cross don't just have a single variant but multiple causal variants that influence gene expression. Here's an extreme example of this gene CWP1, um, where we have a strong EQDL in, in our uh, earlier study, and we now find four um, causal variants that are each significant in the assay, and they all have effects in the same direction, and it looks like you need all four to explain the overall um, EQDL effect here. So, um, even in the single pair of strains, there's you know, a fair amount of complexity in these simple humble yeast promoters. Um, so, okay, with, with a couple of hundred of these variants, we were then um, interested, of course, as whether these variants have something in common, right? Are there any characteristics that they share? And this is where Kaushik Ranganath enters the scene. He's a graduate student in my lab who's really good at you know, crunching data. And uh, one data set that he crunched was this one. Um, what he did is he collected a series of features um, describing each variant. And then for each feature, he asked whether it's associated with whether or not a variant is causal in this assay. Now I'm just going to show you a few highlights from his, from his work. Uh, one thing he found is that variants that are uh, located at more deeply conserved nucleotides across these species are more likely, when, hit, when they're hit by a variant, they're more likely to result um, in change in gene expression. So that's good, right? Conserved sites matter, and when you change them, things happen. Another thing he found was that variants that we find in nature in the promoters of essential genes are less likely to influence gene expression among the variants in our assay. And the way we interpret this is that gene, essential genes are those genes that when you delete them, the yeast cannot grow. Um, so the idea is that you know, the yeast cares about what the, level, the, what the level of this gene is, such that variants that change the expression might be purged from the population by, by negative selection. And all that you're left with are promoter variants that um, in essential gene promoters that don't actually change gene expression. So this starts to sound a little like um, negative selection acting against um, these cis-acting promoter variants. And indeed, when we look at minor allele frequency, we find that variants with lower frequency in the population are more likely to be causal, right? Just like you'd expect if um, purifying selection is trying to push out um, variants that would change, otherwise change gene expression. Um, Kaushik also looked more mechanistically, um, you know, whether we can explain from a mechanistic standpoint which variants change gene expression. And I'm, I'm taking a lot of his work and condensing it into, you know, a, a highly, highly simplified display here. Um, that's just showing you that the more a variant changes predicted transcription factor binding to a promoter, um, the more likely it is to result in gene expression change, right? And so we, we looked at this a number of different ways for individual factors, weak binding, strong binding, sense, anti-sense. The result's always the same, that you know, the, more you the more you predict it to change transcription factor binding, the more um, likely you are to be causal. Okay, so then one question is, can we take all these features and integrate them into a predictive model? Right? So can we say, can we take the associations, combine them and say, is this going to be a causal variant or is that going to be a causal variant? And the short answer is we sort of can, but it doesn't work super well. So this is, this is the best that we've been able to come up with. Um, so it's the area under the uh, operator receiving curve. Um, if it were perfect, you know, the line would shoot up straight up to here and then uh, be flat up here. Um, if, if it were a random guess, it would follow this diagonal. It's somewhat in between. So we are able to predict some causal variants, um, but not perfectly, right? So even in these simple yeast promoters, there's still annotations or features that, that, that are escaping our current knowledge um, to the extent that, that there's something missing in terms of becoming predictive. Okay, that's wrap up this part about causal variance in, in, uh, for local EQTLs. 
told you about this massively parallel reporter essay that we designed. Um, I showed you that individual local EQTLs can have one or multiple causal variants. Um, we see evidence that these variants evolve under negative selection. Um, transcription factor binding sites matter and prediction is, is becoming to be possible, but certainly far from perfect. With that, we're going to switch back to our big EQTL map that I showed you a little while ago, right? And we had we just talked about this diagonal, and we're now going to move off the diagonal because, as you've seen before, um, and I'm as I'm highlighting now, there is a lot of stuff that's not on the diagonal, right? So there are a lot of loci that are not located where the gene is. They're elsewhere. They're often on different chromosomes, even, right? And um, what well, those are, are they not cis-acting variants, but they're trans-acting variants, where the idea is that these variants change the activity or abundance of some factor, and we'll, we'll talk in a while about what those factors are. Um, and then those factors diffuse in the nucleus and the cell, and uh, then change the abundance of other genes, um, such that you have a causal variant that sort of, you know, in a very, can be in a totally different place in the genome than the genes that it's changing. Um, as you've seen here, is that there's a lot of stuff above the, uh, away from the diagonal, right? So the yeast has 5,500 genes that are expressed in this data set. We're discovering more than 36,000 of these EQTLs. That means that, uh, of course, a typical gene is influenced by multiple of these uh, distant transacting EQTLs, right? And um, the average is, is five or six in this data set. And um, this, again, illustrates this point that I will make consistently in this talk, that uh, gene expression itself, mRNA abundance, is a genetically complex trait, right? So in a promoter, you can have multiple variants that influence the expression of this trait. But then you also have variation all over the genome that also alters the expression, mRNA abundance, of a given gene, right? So gene expression is a genetically complex trait. Um, it turns out then that these um, distant transacting EQTLs individually tend to have smaller effects than these local EQTLs. But because there's so many of these trans effects influencing a typical gene, when you sum up the effects of the transacting variants here, you see that they account for a larger fraction of gene expression variation than the local variants, right? So in aggregate, this transacting variation dominates over the local variation that I spent the first um, part of the talk on. And this, this result is not just there in yeast. Similar estimates um, that are a bit more um, in, indirect, for lack of a better word, um, in humans suggest that there is much of the same thing, that there's a, a lot of transacting variation that alters gene expression across the genome. So therefore, you know, let's, let's see what's going on with, with these, all these transacting EQTLs. What can we say about them? Well, one thing that's sort of very obvious from, from again, here's our map, is, is to uh, see that uh, the stuff that's off the diagonal isn't just randomly scattered all over, right? By contrast, there are these regions, say here or there, where one region influences the expression of hundreds and up to thousands of genes, right? So it's, um, these, we, we call these hotspot regions. In our paper, we found 102 of them. Um, and um, because transacting variation is important, and here we have individual regions that influence the expression of hundreds of genes, these hotspots become a really nice system for understanding transacting variants. Um, here's another view uh, of them, just illustrating how widespread their effects are. Um, um, this is the genome, and this is how many genes are influenced by a given hotspot. And you see that it's up to thousands of genes for a few loci, but many loci influence hundreds um, of genes. And keep in mind, yeast only has five, 6,000 genes or so. So some of these loci affect, you know, really almost everything, the cell, um, almost every gene in the genome. The question then becomes, how can that happen, right? So what are some of the causal variants that cause these transacting? Um, hotspots. And uh, this is then a paper that Sheila Lutz in my lab, Dr. Sheila Lutz, our wonderful research scientist, has published last year, where what she has done is taken just three of these hotspots and, and drilled down to the causal variant into each of them um, using uh, methods that I really don't have time to explain. 
it's a, it's a way of doing CRISPR in, in a slightly faster fashion, speeding up allelic engineering at a given locus. But I'm just going to give you the, the, the punchline, right? the big picture result. Um, so Sheila dissected three of these hotspots, found a causal variant in each of them. Let's go through them. The first variant um, is here, a amino acid changing variant in a transcription factor gene called OF1. The variant is very close to the DNA binding site. Um, it is predicted to be deleterious. So this number is, if it's, if it's zero, it means it's predicted to be neutral. If it's not zero, um, such as this one, this is strongly different from zero, it's predicted to be deleterious. Um, we also find that this variant exists essentially only in the lab strain. This is a phylogeny of Cerevisiae strains. And you can see that you know, every strain has the allele that the wine, the wine strain has that's up here, and only the lab strain has it. Other species also have the wine allele. Right? So in this case, we have sort of just what you might expect to be causing uh, gene expression change in trends, right? A rare lab-derived, um, predicted to be damaging, uh, amino acid exchanging variant in a transcription factor, right? So that's exactly what you'd, what you'd think these things would be. Um, the other hotspots weren't like that. The second one, the causal gene is a glucose sensor uh, called RGT2. Here it's, it's a, it's a membrane-bound protein, so here's a, here's a little cartoon of, of its um, structure. The causal variant is this thing here. Um, um, it's in one of the transmembrane domains. It changes a valine to an isoleucine, which is a fairly modest change as far as amino acids go, sort of one uncharged boring amino acid to another uncharged boring amino acid. Um, it's not predicted to be damaging at all, but it is the causal variant. Um, if we look across um, the, the Cerevisiae population, it's a fairly common variant. About 30% or so of strains have it. Um, many of these wine strains here, but other strains as well. Um, other species are also quite variable at the site. Indeed, they're not just variable, they actually contain either of the valine or the isoleucine that we see in our, in our two strains also exist across nature, right? So this is a, high, a fairly labile site evolutionarily, not conserved at all really, but still turns out to be the cause of one in this context. Now the third variant is different again in this case, it's a non-coding variant, um, and it's indeed the variant I showed you before, right? It's that promoter variant that's changing the um, expression level of this OLE1 um, gene which turns out to be an enzyme gene. I'm not going to go into the weeds here, but it's, it's, it's a, a fatty acid desaturase um, that then, and we showed that it's the level of this enzyme that's responsible for changing expression levels of other gene in trans. Um, but evolutionarily, in this case, what we see is that this is a, an even more common variant than this one. Almost all the wine strains have it, and it's also there in other strains. Um, it's 40% it's frequency in, in the entire yeast population, but it's actually a pretty deeply conserved site across species. So most promoter sequences are not very deeply conserved in yeast. This stretch that this variant is in is deeply conserved, so you can see that the sequences are very different, uh, very similar in different, in different species. Um, but then in Cerevisiae, um, this change of an A to G um, then ends up being a causal variant that changes the expression of only one and many, many other genes in trans, right? So our takeaway from this, from Sheila's work here, was really one of, um, of variation and diversity, right? Um, what we've learned then about transacting variants is that first of all, they, you know, they, they're all over the genome. They uh, shape gene expression in a way that predominates over that, um, uh, that acts locally. Um, it, it's clustered in these hotspot regions. Um, and the mechanisms that create these hotspots can, can really be a lot of different things, right? So it's not just transcription factors and it's not just coding variants. Um, it can be any number of things as, as I've just shown you. So that raises uh, a question about how predictive can we become about explaining these sorts of things. Um, we're not there yet. We haven't tried. Um, we don't have enough of these dissected and it's, it's an area of focus for, for us and for the field I think going forward. Um, 
being able to get better at sort of guessing or predicting which variants are going to end up being impactful on, in terms of gene expression, changing gene expression in trans. Okay. We're now going to shift gears a fair bit. So, you know, take a little breath. We're done looking at that uh, 2D EQTL map I showed you. Um, we're mostly done looking at causal variants too, although there will be one at the end. We're going to be now thinking about genetic effects on mRNA versus protein levels for the remainder of this talk. And to motivate this, let's get back to our scheme from the beginning. Here's our genetically different population variants causing mRNA change. And we made this assumption that when you get a change in mRNA, that um, that should lead to a change in protein. And then it's that that actually influences the trait, right? So, well, what about that assumption though, right? It turns out that the vast, vast majority of work into regulatory variation in yeast and other species, particularly in humans, um, is doing what we also did in the first study I showed you, which is looking at mRNA abundance, right? So we, we take a gene, we measure its expression, and then we map it to the genome. We, the gene is here. We might find these two loci, right? One local and one distant. Um, now, a few studies have then used mass spectrometry and other methods to measure the protein abundance of the same genes and map that to the genome, right? And when you do that, you tend to get, you know, some loci that are the same, but you also tend to find a fair amount of discrepancy. So this mRNA locus here didn't have an effect on protein levels. And here's two protein effects that seem to arise, you know, not from mRNA levels. Depending on which study you look at, this has been done, you know, and then maybe know, less than a dozen studies at least or so, there's, a, there's a quite a bit of a range here, right? So some studies find a lot of concordance, say, yeah, these discrepancies are, aren't all that common. Others find more discrepancies. Um, one study even mentioned that the low side that influence mRNA and proteins are sort of uh, significantly deriched from each other, that they're almost in repulsion, right? But it really depends on the study you look at. So um, we really don't know what this discrepancy is, and that is because there's um, a, an underlying issue with all of these comparisons, and that is they're all based on comparing data that was collected as part of independent different projects at different times, in different labs, by different people, sometimes even different experimental designs, right? And we know at the same time that gene expression in, in yeast in particular, it can be very sensitive to the exact environment, right? Your temperature is off a little, your pH is off a little, your oxygen isn't quite right. Um, so we know that that changes gene expression and it also changes, uh, can change um, in particular transacting um, influences on gene expression, right? So this is, is, is sort of not an ideal state of affairs. Instead, what we would like then is a system where we measure mRNA and protein at the same time in the same cells, such that all environmental fluctuations, what have you, are, are just you know, well controlled because we're measuring things at the same time. And importantly, we have to be able to do so at a large sample size, so in many cells, because as I've shown you a number of times now, the effects that we're after in this whole line of work um, are relatively small. That's what nature has given us. And to find them, we have to have high statistical power. Now, to attack this particular challenge, um, well, I attacked it by hiring a really great postdoc, Christian Brignon, who joined, uh, joined us from uh, Joseph Schacker's lab in, in France. And then Christian sunk his teeth into, into this problem for, for a couple of years and came up with this, with this uh, beautiful system here. Um, a reporter system that measures mRNA protein for a given gene in the same cells at the same time. How does it do it? Um, for protein, it actually turns out that's the easy part in, in this because he is using green fluorescent protein fusions that uh, you know, in yeast exist as part of the GFP um, library. Um, straightforward has been used hundreds, thousands of times um, such that green fluorescence then measures protein abundance, right? Um, for mRNA, Here's what Christian does. Um, he puts a tag behind the GFP gene that um, uh, encodes a guide RNA. That guide RNA is flanked by two ribosomes, 
such that uh, upon transcription of the, uh, of the mRNA, the ribozymes cleave, they release the guide RNA. The guide RNA then finds a deactivated Cas9 protein, so it shows that it's a CRISPR-based system, CRISPR-Cas9 based system. So it, it finds this deactivated Cas9 that cannot cut DNA, um, but that instead is fused through a transcriptional activator, and then the, that whole complex gets directed to an, inter, an, an M cherry gene that we have inserted in uh, the genome, such that then um, M cherry red fluorescence should be proportional to mRNA production, um, and green fluorescence should be proportional to protein abundance. Um, to make sure that this works, um, we're using another one of these amazing things that exist in yeast, a, a synthetic promoter system that allows us to control the expression of a given gene via the concentration of estradiol in the medium. Right? So the more estradiol, the higher the expression of a given gene once you've engineered it um, with the system. When Christian applies then his reporter to um, the gene that's, that's uh, you know, controlled by estradiol, this is what he gets. So here is uh, the concentration of estradiol um, as that goes up. GFP goes up. As, it, as well it should, but also M cherry, um, our readout of mRNA also goes up. You'll note that the dynamics of these two aren't, aren't exactly the same. M cherry is, is quite linear initially and then it, then it plateaus earlier than the, than the GFP, but still in a more direct comparison shown here where we have mRNA level of our reported gene measured by qPCR, quantitative real-time PCR, compared to M cherry fluorescence, um, which is our ultimate readout, we see that, you know, certainly up to this expression level here, there's a really nice linear relationship, and then, then, then we enter this plateau. But even in the plateau, um, there still remains this, you know, monotonic relationship that more mRNA results in, in higher um, M-cherry fluorescence. And we also, we think that, you know, more than half of the yeast, of the genes in the yeast genome fall into this uh, quantifiable, linear range here. Um, all right, so that's how the system works that Christian has built. It you know, measures mRNA protein abundance in, in single living cells, so we don't have to kill them, don't have to fix them. Um, at the same time, in a, in a way that's quantitative, at least certainly quantitative enough for what we are going to do with this, um, which is map genetic variation influencing mRNA protein abundance. So, the way Christian did it is he took our two strains again, the, the lab strain, the wine strain, he crossed them. He puts in his signal, uh, his system, such that he then keeps only those segregants that have all the components that they need. Um, but in contrast to the first study I described, where we had taken individual segregants and you know, assayed them, here we're keeping these segregants as a pool. Um, we're keeping, you know, up to millions of them in this genetically diverse population in a single tube, um, which is a design that also Trishka's lab has been has been used has been using very productively. We've been using earlier. Other labs have been using in yeast. It's, it's it's just a really powerful way of 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 mapping things. Um, here's how you actually map it. So you you have your you know your cells in a tube. You just go to a fluorescence activated cell sorter and run them through. Um, and then you collect extreme cells, right? So Christian collects 10,000 cells with um, the one to 2% highest and lowest mRNA abundance as quantified by M. Cherry here. And then um, we do bulk whole genome sequencing of these two populations and compare them genetically. This is what the, um, what the data then um, looks like. Um, we are taking the sequence differences that exist between the two strains, look at their frequency in the high and the low population, um, and compare them to each other across most of the genome. Then, so genomes here, a little frequency difference there. Across most of the genome, there isn't much difference, but we have these deflections here where there are loci that influence the gene of interest. And you see that there's a number of them here. The gene that was tagged itself was located here. And again, you'll notice that the genus in chromosome 11, the loci are all elsewhere. 
And that is because they're all transacting also, right? So by design, the system was constructed um, to map um, transacting effects, which as I told you, are just um, um, important for how um, genetics changes gene expression. Um, okay, so this is how we do it for mRNA. For protein, we do the same thing really. We just sort um, on the green color, get our two populations um, sequence and get our trace here. When we put these traces on top of each other and compare them. Um, so in this case, for the MTD1 gene, we get uh, two loci that influence both mRNA and protein significantly. Um, we get two loci that have effects that uh, only affect mRNA. And we get six loci in this case that influence only protein, right? This is, although this system is literally looking at the same cells at the same time um, in, in a fashion that really can't be much influenced by environmental fluctuations. Christian repeated this, um, this type of experiment for 10 different genes. Across the 10 genes, he finds uh, 68 loci. Um, a, min a minority of those are consistent for mRNA and protein. Even fewer mRNA specific, the majority is protein specific, right? So, um, and again, although the system perfectly controls for environmental influences, it still finds um, a large degree of discrepancy, in particular these protein specific um, loci. So yeah, you know, trans effects are still complex. They're still from all over the genome influencing a given gene of interest. Um, and it really does look like these influences can be quantitatively distinct for mRNA and proteins. Um, I'm almost at the end. I'll just quickly share with you um, another thing Christian did at the end of his, of his, of his paper, and that is he chose one of these regions um, with a protein-specific effect for, for fine mapping. So here's this region. Um, it has a consistent effect on GFP, but not on, 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 his, M on his mRNA reporter. Um, this is the region, contains multiple genes. I'm not going to go through how we fine mapped it. He used the same trick that, that Sheila published in her paper last year. Um, uh, the causal gene turns out to be, in this case, a kinase, which, believe it or not, is called yet another kinase 1 um, in yeast, YAK1. The variant is a premature stop mutation in the predicted kinase catalytic domain. Um, Christian finds that it behaves like a knockout of this gene. It's not a natural variant, though. This is a variant that exists in the GFP um, yeast strain collection. Um, and there it exists in every strain that we tested, five out of five had this exact variant. So it, it, it's not a mutation that we made in the lab. It looks like it's already in the collection. So for those of you working on yeast in the GFP collection, know that you have something in there that is a uh, changing protein abundance for at least some genes. Um, what we then went on to show is that this variant indeed has this effect on the protein abundance of this GPD-1 gene that, that Christian used to you know, map this whole uh, the variant. In the same cultures, there really is not an effect on mRNA. Um, so this looks like a protein-specific effect. And then Christian went on and did genome-wide transcriptomics and, and proteomics on this variant. And what he finds is actually something that, that to me is very interesting, right? Um, that the effects of this variant are not specific to GPD-1. They affect other genes as well, but they affect them in what looks like, in a way that for some genes, they're more protein specific, in others, they're more mRNA specific, for others, they're more shared. And I think that's something that we'll probably end up finding more as we drill into more of these transacting causal variants, that their effects on mRNA and protein are not gonna be 100% neatly distinct, you know, purely protein, purely mRNA, purely both, but more, um, as, as you might imagine, right? A quantitative continuum um, in which different genes, depending how they are related to the given causal gene, will be influenced at the mRNA or protein level in different ways. So it'll be exci exciting to drill into that more as we go forward. So that's it. That's my final summary. Um, everything I told you, gene expression is a genetically complex trait. We've done work on the cis-acting promoters. They may become predictable. 
not quite, but perhaps at some point, trans acting variation is important, um, can be caused by all kinds of cool things. And uh, those effects on protein MRI can be quite distinct. Thank you very much for your attention. Here is my lab. I highlight the work of a few people. We have others, some of our funding sources. Um, we're really interested in genetic variation within and between species. So I'll just leave this up and uh, we'll be happy to take questions. Great. Let's see, where's the applause? There we go, <laughs> applause icon. Thank you, Frank. Um, so I will uh, be happy to moderate sort of questions here. So if you have some, go ahead and drop them in a chat. Um, and I know it often takes a moment to, to compose your questions. So I will ask my own selfish one first. Um, so I was really interested in the section where you were talking about the sort of molecular nature of the transbregatory variants, right? And, and I um, agree with you that the mental model that we mostly have is these are variants in transcription factors and that that's why they're impacting many genes because the job of a transcription factor is to control expression of many genes. Um, and you know, we've been taking, I think, a complementary approach to these things, looking at the effects of mutations and then comparing to variants, right? Standing variation, whereas you've come from the standing variation. And we're seeing the same thing as the punchline, right? That that yes, we hit, you know, some of the mutations we recover are affecting transcription factors, but many are affecting different classes of genes, including the types that you mentioned. So because you've spent more time looking at the the allele frequencies of your variants among sort of naturally occurring strains. I'm curious if you see any um, differences among functional classes of proteins at that level. So for instance, are transcription factor variants more likely to be rare alleles than some of the other classes? Uh, that's a really good question to which I don't have an answer, unfortunately. Um, so we don't have enough of these variants. I mean, we as, as a lab, but also we as a community, I think that are standing I think, I think the mutations that you have identified are by a certain multiplier more than the ones that we know about from natural variants. At this point. Okay. Uh, so, you know, and, and there's just not enough to systematically answer that question. And also we have, we have, we, we also haven't looked this way. Um, so I just don't know, but it's, it's a really, it's a good question, right? Where they're sort of, I don't know, the more essential the gene, maybe the more rare the variant, but, but I know that also doesn't work, right? It, because of the, of the three cases I, I showed, it's actually the enzyme that's essential and the other two are not. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, the enzyme doesn't have, I mean, the variant is non-coding, right? So, so maybe there's sort of a, a trade-off there. I think ultimately, it'll, it'll need more of these things dissected to really begin to tease out. Mm -hmm. um, Patterns. I'm, I'm sure there are patterns, right? I, I, I don't want to be so nihilistic and say, you know, it can be anything, you know, no rules apply. I, I think this, this, there's definitely going to be some patterns, but, but so far it's just not enough yet to really know what they are. Yeah. And that addresses actually my, my follow-up question, which was about the balance of coding and non-coding variants in the transregulatory pool, right? So, and um, there is actually the case that there the balance so far tips rather heavily towards coding. Um, there are, you know, for a while I thought that the only one variant was the first that's actually demonstrated to be non-coding. It's not quite true. Barack Cohen has, has one or two that are non-coding and that, that are a hotspot if, if that's, he never calls them that, but sort of that's, I, I call them that. So. So far, that balance actually tips towards coding. But again, I'm, I'm sure there's a detection bias, right? It's, it's just easier to drill into those um, than the non-coding ones. Yeah, certainly easier to predict which ones might impact the protein sequence and therefore function. Yeah. Um, so I see that Petra has added a, a question to the chat. I can read it or, or she can speak for herself. Um, I'll pause in case Petra wants to unmute and ask it herself. Um, sure, I suppose so. <laughs> or you can read it either way. But the question was basically for um, those cis-acting variants that you have identified as causal using that massively parallel reporter assay. Um, have you looked to see if there's any relationship between the transcription factor binding sites that are influenced by those causal variants and the TFs that are predicted to bind them 
um, as to whether or not they might harbor a transregulatory variant or if they themselves are diverged in their expression? That's another fantastic question and, and an analysis that we did very crudely um, and there wasn't much there. Um, you're probably thinking in terms of co-evolution of these things, right? Where sort of you, I don't know, let's say you start with imitation and the transcription factor and then all the binding sites have to catch up, that sort of thing, right? Um, we haven't looked closely enough to really say that there that that's not there, but I would like to say that because here we're within species, right? Um, I don't know that there really would have been enough time for say to by mutate a factor and then dozens and hundreds of promoter sequences have caught up to that in a way. Between species, I, th I think that will be very different actually. Right, because there, either there's just more time, um, more mutations, and 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 perhaps also stronger selection over a longer time to sort of um, get get this get this the species or the strain to a new balance where it needs to be. So it's it's a really it's a really great point, and uh, we're not we're not seeing much of it so far. Okay, thank you. Great. Any other questions? I do see that we're a few minutes after four o'clock. So what I'd like to do with Frank's permission is, is kind of officially end it, but to create the like milling around opportunity that usually happens in person, if you can hang on for a couple minutes. I know I have a couple other things I'd rather just kind of, you know, in a smaller group talk with you about. Sure. Okay. All right. So thank you all for coming. Um, and yeah, feel free to, to leave meeting now. <laughs> Thanks everybody for coming out today. <laughs> All right. Um, let's see. Sorry, just give a minute here. Oh, Jacob Kitts didn't really enjoy the talk. Sorry, go ahead, Katrina. Do you want me to continue the recording or to stop it? No, you can go ahead and stop the recording. Thank you. <laughs>